Today, you are going to get a front row seat to the incredible Springbok career of Lawrence Sipaka. Lawrence, welcome to Front Row Rugby. No, thank you, Peter. Nice to be here. It's great to have you here as well. Before we begin our conversation, let's take a look at today's trivia question. In 2003, the Springboks started their international season with a two-test series. Who were the opponents? Now, if you know the answer to the question, you can put it in the comment section down below. And we'll also find out if Lawrence knows the answer, but we'll do that at the end of the conversation. Lawrence, I'd like to begin in 2001. Talk to me about how you were feeling ahead of your test debut against the United States. Uh, it was always an honor. I mean, representing your country, first of all, is just an applause. Because obviously, the emotions are there. You're overwhelmed. You want to do well. You want to do your best at the same time. So you don't know. Basically, what it comes down to is to do your best, whatever it is, however it comes. Just do your best. So sometimes you don't even remember most of that game. That's how quickly it goes by. The match took place in Houston. What did you make of that as a city? Um, it was actually lovely. Uh, America, I mean, uh, I've never been to America before then. And obviously, I think we're the place where only thing that I can associate with knowing something about there, it was actually, I think, Levi's jeans. I think we're very close by where it was actually being manufactured. And then the, and obviously, we thought, oh, okay, now maybe we must get it. But there was no time for that as well, because you want to stay streamlined and making sure that you go straight and focus. And obviously, you know, the hype as well being up to the game. I suppose starting against America, which is not a, one of the top tier nations at the time, was an advantage as well, because I'm sure you can only do well when it comes to that. And obviously, the only mistakes you make is probably just basic errors there and there. As you mentioned, we don't really play against them that often. In fact, it's the only time that the Springboks have played against the USA, certainly since readmission. Do you think it would be a good idea if we played there more often? Well, I suppose it will help their rugby, that's for sure. But for us, in probably would have an opportunity just to create some death, play some youngsters. Maybe if they get a couple of games, although it's a test matches against the country, but when you actually give some youngsters that probably future prospects, like the under-23s and stuff like that, would actually help us as well. Otherwise, you play your full strength team, you're sort of helping them. So you gotta find a balance somewhere where you plan in your youngsters. And I suppose those teams are probably ideal to make sure that uh, you know the rugby grows. Obviously, the youngsters come into the streamline of big time rugby and obviously get opportunity you not know, to be under Jurassic playing some of the top teams. Sometimes if uh, Come, push comes to shove. I mean, you gotta sink or swim, and you just gotta take opportunities. And a, some of these youngsters today as well, I think they they very confident in their endeavors. They they they've got this demeanor, but when they know at that level, they carry themselves in a certain way. They ooze confidence, and sometimes that helps them just to get in those situations as if they've been there a long time. Which I've noticed to see with the World Cup as well. Those youngsters are standing tall as if they've been doing this for some time. Harry Fulyun was the Springbok coach that gave you your international debut. What did you make of him as a coach? I actually honestly think I think it was slightly ahead of his time because at the time he was just one of those coaches who was trying to give you know the baton over to the player to make his own decision on the field at the time, uh, where most of the players were coming from a structure where most South Africans really like to stick to the line of structure, boxed. In and because we had the kind of athletes that you box them in and give them a certain mandate, they'll break walls to make sure that mandate is fulfilled. So he was a kind of coach who was coming in, trying to be flamboyant at the same time, not too far too forward, because you now need to adjust certain players to fit in, in a certain kind of game plan that you're trying to play, which is more flamboyant but structured at the same time, if you know what I mean, making that decision on the run as well, depending on what kind of position you get. But I don't know how well he was received by South Africans as well. I kind of enjoyed them. He allowed you to think out of the box as well. Unfortunately, I was not in a position to think much more in a more crafting position. So I feel sorry for those guys who had to make decisions like the flyers and the fullbacks and the centers and all of that. Our job was to forward, get the job done so the backs can have ball to actually do something with. And then he was out of the picture in 2002, replaced by Rudolf Strauli. Um, we were actually playing quite well, even though we maybe were not getting the results we wanted in the Tri-Nations. But there was that one test match against the All Blacks in Durban when a certain supporter named Pitt van Sale ran onto the field and tackled the referee. What was going through your mind at that moment? Yeah, that was a tense match. It was on a nice edge, to be honest, with both teams on top of their game taking each other on. I know particularly well 
the forwards were really on top of the All Blacks at a time. It was a matter of just when the All Blacks are going to crash or maybe when they're going to crumble so we can start stumbling them over. We're on that edge. I think the Fancelsa saga sort of take a, took some of our forwards out of the zone and basically deflate, uh, deflected them. And then when we came back from that, that just the window that the All Blacks needed to get us because we had a couple of players and obviously were frustrated with this or obviously thought that was a mess up of the situation that was going well for us. And then it started going downhill for us in terms of them not getting on top of us at that time. But honestly speaking, that was a good match. I enjoyed it. Physically, it was physical. It was back. But obviously, once you get the All Blacks get on top of you, sometimes very difficult to get back uh, on that on that horse. They basically, theirs is bolted. It's catching it. It's very difficult. So it's very important to always when you play the All Blacks, you stay on top or you stay close enough to be able to catch them at some point. The following week, we did get a win against the Wallabies at Ellis Park. Van Achreef scoring a try right at the end to win it for us. I know he had to uh, kick the conversion as well to make sure. How memorable was that occasion? And I remember as well, I almost scored as well. a pick and go right in front of the pole. Someone struck me, but I guess gave enough momentum for us to get on the outside as well on the other side. It was a special game. I think that was actually a very fiery game, to be honest. I and mean, the guys were really coming for each other on both sides. But we're glad to get on top of that one because we needed a confidence as well in terms of going forward. So it was uh, pretty interesting. And I'm actually happy for Werner because he was not one of those flash players. He was actually rigid, got straightforward players, but tough as nails as well. So for him to be able to have snatched that one out of the jerseys, Australia's jerseys, was actually quite nice for South Africans as well. And speaking of confidence, we then went on an end-of-year tour where we lost quite badly to France and then we suffered a defeat against Scotland uh, in Edinburgh. Uh, how low would you say was the morale in the camp at that stage? It was a difficult time. Uh, you must also understand, man. if you know how difficult it is, look, just look at the picture of uh, Eddie Jones currently, how his situation is now coming in, trying to res- resurrect the Australian rugby, trying to push in a certain direction, and things go pear shape, but he needs to make decisions how to go forward from there. He needs to pick up the pieces. I think Rudolph was in a similar situation where he was trying to build for a World Cup, and obviously this time he needed to make decisions how to go about it as well. And obviously his game plan was slightly different to the one of... Um, um, for Lune, and then obviously he wanted to have his own identity as well, but he was a hard man. So he actually, when it comes to forwards, we probably got tougher, but we probably was not as flash at the back as we probably would have liked to be. But uh, I suppose that's why sometimes you need to, if you, 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 you're a certain kind of coach, you need certain kind of coaches alongside you to actually enhance you, to give you that edge on other things that you're really not capable of doing. Because remember, Ahead of a rugby coach, that's why you've got a forward and a backline coach. You need someone to actually assist you. You've got a strategy to put down. They need an assistant coach, players to actually try to capture this thing as much as they can and going forward. And then into 2003, uh, we were not really playing that well, but we did get a good win in the Tri-Nations against Australia at home. That was actually on my birthday, so thank you very much for that. Uh, but then after that, we suffered a bad defeat against the All Blacks at Loftus, 52-16. How much of a low moment was that? Yeah, listen, it, 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 well, for us, it didn't feel low because we worked very hard on the field. It's just that the All Blacks were just covering us like... Uh, left, right, and center. You don't know where to look. But in, in terms of the field, you feel like you look, at that point, you start focusing on your individual situation where you basically looking at what you can do on your own and going forward. And obviously, when they get an opportunity, they just make it look easier. Ours was a lot difficult and stuff like that. Before the 2003 Rugby World Cup and after that New Zealand defeat, we had a little uh, pre-tournament camp that the boys attended called Camp Staldrod. Uh, as I told you before we began the interview, Lawrence, I've had more than 50 former Springboks on the show. Many of them attended Camp Staldrod and all of them have got a story to tell. What's your story about Camp Staldrod? No, listen, that thing, man, I, it was uh, quite an experience. I've never been to the military, so some of us, it was a preview what it looks like to go to the military, to be honest, that the kind of work the soldiers actually go through. But also the purpose of that as well, I think it was well-intended, well-placed, but probably ill-timed. That's probably for me, where it probably might have gone skew in terms of what they were trying to do with that. Because, for you, for example, we did it um, before a weekend, before we traveled, and then we came back on a Friday, went home to our families, came back on Monday or Tuesday, and then we took off to the World Cup. 
But if we have done that thing and then got onto the plane to the World Cup, I think we would have been a different team altogether because I think it managed to get exactly what it was intended. Uh, your, su- your, 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 your superstars like the US and obviously the young ones to actually merge somewhere to become sort of a unit. It did exactly that because it humbled those guys and obviously encouraged the young ones as well. Like, listen, at the end of the day, that when it comes to team, that's where we need to be. And obviously from here on, work as a unit, work together because we become one, we become family. And then I think when that thing happened and then the weekend happened, we went back to our own homes and then it was actually a difficult situation because you could see some things were undone. Although a lot of people are seeing like it was just it's a bad thing. No, it was nothing bad at all. It was a team building exercise. And I think it got its, it, it, it got its intended purpose, but I think it was ill time. That's the only problem that it was. But then unfortunately that was used as an excuse for bad rugby, which I think it was actually unfair. It was not related. Um, we probably were not playing the best rugby. You should have just, uh, you know, punished us for the terrible rugby we were playing instead of, looking for other reasons. But obviously, like in any other case, for people to have a reason to punish someone or to actually criticize someone, they need to have a sort of a starting point. This probably could have been the reason why, which I think was absolutely not. It was not even uh, related. I mean, those things you see, you've seen England do such, uh, obviously, with those uh, military exercises when they go to what they the use. Because those guys know how to get teams to uh, settle, you know, top two inches. No New Zealanders when they train, and they've got these manuals They've got these things that they need to meet. And most of the time, and most of the time, they don't work to the number. They actually go beyond and see how much your body can actually take, how much mental capacity can you actually withstand to ensure that you can go through any situation without actually emotionally breaking down. You know what I mean? That's what it was all was serving to get your top two inches on your head, to get you mentally tough. And then that's what I'm saying is basically it's all about those top two inches that uh, they're trying to get and when they go to those things, take you out of your comfort zone. Because, I mean, you can train as hard as you like. You can train until you pass out. But then just to take your mind in a different zone, different uh, spectrum, it does help you just to deal with foreign things in a situation when you're under pressure most of the time. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, why not consider becoming a patron? It's my dream, guys, to do this full time. And with a small financial contribution, you can help me realize that dream. The link and the QR code is appearing on your screen right now and I'll also put it down in the description area for you to go and click on at a later stage if you would like to do so. And by becoming a patron, I promise there will be great benefits for members. Now let's get back to the interview. And what was the belief like in the camp ahead of that World Cup, would you say? No, listen, now we had a plan and then everything was set out, guys were in the zone, like I said, if that camp happened just before we go on a plane and go to to Australia, I think would have actually that on its own would have carried us very far. I don't know how far, but would have certainly carried us very far into the World Cup. Just an emotional, mental space that we were in would have really done so much work for for a South African team at that time. And ultimately, we were beaten in the quarterfinals by New Zealand quite comfortably, to be honest. And I think it's fair to say that the Springboks did struggle in that 2003 period. Why do you think that was the case? Well, if you notice as well, I mean, uh, in every international uh, venture, international trip, international opportunity where people are involved or other coaches or players, you're either in a a time where things are going glorious and uh, rosy or in a time that things are not really as smooth as they're supposed to be. And remember, at the end of the day, in a team environment, you are only responsible for that tiny little part of yours. But how you played as well, how you actually take all that in as well, it depends on, on, on yourself as an individual. But obviously, we would have liked to have better results, but we still think it was a great honor and privilege to be able to in that position because you know how many other people could have been then, uh, could have actually had an opportunity to play. So you just take that opportunity and enjoy it at what the time it is. It was your turn, yeah? You didn't win a World Cup or anything like that, but you were actually competitive at some some stages. But that's how it is. I mean, just after that as well, someone else comes in, things go well. And you actually support them as well and wish them well because you always want to try and leave the jersey in a better position that you found it. So if they could have taken it from that way, we left it and moved it to another level. It means just build pressure for the next person to come in and does exactly the same thing. Earlier, I asked you about Harry Fulhuna as a coach. How would you describe Rudolf Strauli? 
No, Rulo Stral, like I said, it was a, a forward base kind of mentality, which for a forward, I actually enjoyed him. I think I played some of my best rugby under him. He got me into that mental space. And uh, I think that's a time as well. I think I had a six pack, which you really see from the front rowers these days. <laughs> so, you know, so because they, they, they just that bulky man, uh, he really, I think he, he personally pushed me to a point where I think, I mean, I was comfortable in my space in myself at, at, at any given time. Hence, one could even venture and going to the other side. Remember, I was a lucid most of the time. And I've grown so much at that time that I would venture in going to a tight head from time to time just to, as a learning curve because you play against so many tight heads that you actually pick up on those tricks as to what they actually struggled or you struggled with when you play with certain players. And you start watching them as well and you start growing. Um, it was actually, I enjoyed my time that time and that term as well. And obviously, in general, the game would have been nice to have won more or won more cups and stuff like that. But it didn't happen. But the opportunity to have been able to be part of that mix for me was nice. And then you were out of the picture for a while, but you returned in 2005. Talk to me about how much different the Bok camp was under Jake White. Yeah, no, listen, like I said, um, it was a different time. And Jake had his own plans at the time as well. And you were coming to an environment now you were dealing with different challenges. But it was like one of those things that you're getting an opportunity to reinvent yourself and you just keep on pushing barriers that are put in front of you. I think at that time, and the kind of plans Jake had, I don't think the minute I made into the team, uh, thanks to the Lions, because I think at the Lions, and we did so well that some of us needed to be picked for the national team. I think when I got into that setup, Jake had these plans, but the look of the players that he picked up, he had actually very bulky players, like the John Smith, and uh, he brought back uh, us, which was a, a big man, and obviously CJ. I was slightly short and stockier compared to those guys, and understandably as well, that's what he was building from going forward as well. But the look of things when I sat back and I started analyzing this, but I did try to push. I literally just fell out in 2006, end of the year tour, where he needed to really anchor his team that he really wanted to take to the next World Cup and stuff like that. And, uh, and obviously that was another, obviously, closing of a chapter in the international jersey. And uh, which I thought as well, I gave it everything I could to try and make that team. It probably was not supposed to be. Um, and those guys ended up going to win the World Cup. Maybe one thing, maybe his players he stuck to it. And then the reason he got it as well, because we we're playing in a, in France. I mean, the bigger you are in Europe, the bigger and heavier you are. I think it was advantageous at the time because England was a place where the fields were very heavy. And obviously, the bigger force you had, the more advantageous you actually would have had. So he actually paid, I mean, it paid dividends for him because those players came through for him. I mean, he had a big pack of forwards. And then the big backups, probably one or two guys were probably not as big, but he was like size was important. I think he picked the player up due to his size and the skill level with something that he would look after afterwards. But and I suppose he, he well, that was his plan. It worked for him. We we're happy. They brought the World Cup up on the time. And I feel like, I mean, you probably played a part in it in, in that build up because you were trying to push this guy to get into the team. It means they had to up their game in order to avoid you getting into the team. To get them on their toes, I mean, that's what competition is about at the end of the day, which is actually quite good. I think that's a, that's a kind of environment that the current box I now, the competition is healthy. It's so it challenges individuals not to be comfortable and complacent in their position. So it pushes them all the time. As we are talking about 2006, as you mentioned, that was the last year that you featured for the Springboks. Your last test match was actually against Ireland in Dublin, where we were wearing special commemorative jerseys because it was the 100th anniversary of the Springbok emblem being used for the first time. But we did lose quite convincingly that night, unfortunately. Talk to me about that occasion. No, although the occasion was actually momentous and actually quite nice to be part of that setup, I still got a jersey. I never give it away. A lot of people actually wanted it. I mean, it's, it's a special time for the box at the time. Unfortunately, I think we got an Irish team that was also in a better position, like conditioning in terms of how they were playing at the time and how confident they were. And we came short, but it didn't take away from the momentous occasion. I mean, it's always going to be in history. But you always want to end up those momentous occasions with the win. But in terms of sport, sometimes you're not guaranteed until you rock up on the day and do what you need to do. So, I mean, let's say you might be a favorite before, but it could be a different story by the end of the game. Not that we were favorites as such, but I think the the momentous occasion as well probably might have taken most of our concentration and maybe our focus as well coming to that game because we wanted really to win, but unfortunately couldn't win. But I think it was also a great time. I mean, 
uh, Springbok Rabi been around for 100 years, been part of that history as well. It was actually quite nice. Okay, Springbok fans, my friend Mike Greenaway has a new book out, The Fireside Springbok. As a seasoned rugby writer with over 25 years of experience, Mike unveils the untold stories that define the greatness of the box. His unique perspective, gained through unparalleled access to the team, makes this book a must-read for true rugby enthusiasts. The Fireside Springbok is on sale now. Okay, Lawrence, who was your toughest opponent? Yo, this guy, I keep on forgetting his name. I think it was around Tana Umaga's time, the Hurricanes. They had, uh, I mean, the Tana Umaga... Um, and uh, obviously the other inside center the with the dreadlocks as well. I just miss his name. But they were pairing in the center pair. But they had a pack forward. There was a, a milk a dairy farmer who was playing tight at the time for them. I remember that for a fact because he was probably the hardest person to scrum against it physically. He was a rock hard man. Um, but technically we managed to actually hustle it out most of the time. But another guy, most of the old blacks, is Carl Heyman. Kaleman was a strange one to scrum against. It was this lengthy tall guy. You'd think you'll get your way if you're short, but he had a technique that actually didn't allow you to get close to his term somehow. And then another one is Somerville. Somerville was tricky. For him, if he knew, if you close your gap with your hooker, that was trouble for him. He would normally stand away from his hooker. You know that, as Lou said, you need to be on his right shoulder, not on his inside shoulder. And that would mean you need to loosen your bind slightly to get to there. But that was his trick to actually try to loosen you from your hooker so he can take that space and occupy it. Once he's in there, you couldn't get him out. So that was another the fun times. They were tough, but I suppose also challenging. They made you think at times as well. And reason, okay, um, you can't manage to do this. Remember being a front row as well, uh, the tighter you are, it was much better. So him loosening me that, that mentally, actually it was a trick from him that I learned. Like, listen, this is actually quite smart. But nowadays, I don't think it would have worked <laughs> because it would have been head to head. I mean, obviously, we wouldn't have allowed to do that. And at the time, we were still traveling. I suppose um, you needed to be quick in how you did your things as well. But I mean, those are the times that I can remember in that position. And then playing lucid as well, it was um, quite nice. And obviously, maturing as well, going to tight it a couple of times, which I think sometimes were that advantageous. But um, I think I played against Australia tight it. A bit Bill Young. Remember, Young at the time was a very tricky character. Uh, he came up with a thing of swimming. You know, as a loose head who swims around and the whole scrum follows him. And the refs couldn't just get a hold of it. How does he do this? But it didn't seem illegal at the time because the whole pack was doing it. So coming against him, I knew I had to deal with this. Now, how do I deal with this? It was a pretty tricky one. So I realized that, listen, he's tall. I'm short. Rather lock him down and stay low as possible. If he does swing, let him keep him here and I drop the scrum. Then he can be exposed on the outside if he can actually <laughs> roll away. And you can't go, if you, your backside goes outside, the referee can actually pick up immediately that you were not going straight. So those are the interesting times that the guys were actually putting up as a gauntlet coming to the position. People say normally props are not thinkers. Props are some of the smartest guys around because they need to make a plan in a very intense and... Um, dangerous situation and actually try to survive at the same time because you get something wrong in that front row position could be detrimental for your hooker or for yourself for that matter. I mean, I mean spines have broken before. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky one, which is also a good one in the same time. That uh, he, he gives you that challenge. Like I said, you do a lot of training before that as well. So those are the guys who actually gave me sort of an interesting time when it comes to scrimmaging. Lawrence, I have to ask you, when you look around today, is there a particular player that stands out for you as somebody that you admire? Hi, some of the players today, and I think some of them are superhuman. Um, are you in the front row specifically or in the backs? Oh, anywhere, anywhere. Or in South Africa or any player? Any player. Well, I actually quite enjoy John Mal. I think he's got some uh, sense of humor in the team that's very rigid. And it would have been interesting to be around the same room most of the time because he seemed like a comedian. You know, when you pick him up on socials, he's a character. But on a rugby field, we didn't say he's a character. Um, from the English side, I also, um, which I actually enjoy, I enjoy Ox, how he's transformed. I mean, he was good before he was picked with the box. I thought he was ripe at the time when they went to the 2019 World Cup. But unfortunately... I think this occupied it. There were other players I think coach was more comfortable with. 
But what I've done with him as well, they've transformed his body into some sort of machine. I was worried he's going to lose a bit of speed. But now, listen, uh, he's actually coming lips and bounds. He's doing a great job. He's one of the devastating props in world rugby currently. On our side, I think some of the youngsters, like the Moody's and uh, and uh, the Grant Williams that have come in, just amazing the kind of, you know, the kind of sharpness they come with. I mean, they quality people by character, but you see that their eyes are always watching what's happening on the other side. So those are some of the players I actually quite enjoy watching and I obviously see what they do. Lawrence, you mentioned Joe Marler there and being a character and funny moments that he brought to the game. I have to ask you, is there a particularly funny moment that you can share with us from your time with the Springboks? Oh, <laughs> no, actually not. But I think one uh, particular I can remember, um, I mean, uh, like a, like an inside ritual in the Springbok team as well, you know, like um, only the captain can get his own room. Um, and I was probably the one guy in the Springbok team until today under the caps of 50 that managed to get his own room. And the reason for that as well, I think apparently I was quite of a snorer. No player could actually can withstand that. I mean, the captain, John Smith, I mean, luckily I played with him from my age group as well. He actually gave up his single room so that he can share with someone. Remember, captain can have his own room to share with someone so that I can have my own so they can be just at peace. Because you can't imagine people being grumpy most of the time because someone is snoring and you can't actually put coach in that position. Do I pick this guy or do I not pick this guy because he's causing a bit of a havoc here because people can't sleep. It's unfortunately the nature. So I thought that was one thing that a lot of players actually, I mean, made a joke about it. They were not personal or anything like that. But I also think on the hand side, I was pretty lucky that I was around players with obviously who could be managed to do that. I mean, that's why I, still today, I think I respect John Smith for that, for really giving up a position of privilege that he deserved to allow me to get an opportunity to Springbok Jays and actually be able to pull around 24 caps. And obviously this thing must have started very early. I know guys really couldn't handle him. I mean, uh, Kobus Fasahi really struggled. I think he had one opportunity to sleep with me. The next day he was gone. <laughs> so that's probably one that John Smith made that decision. Like, listen, okay, this is going to be the situation. Let's deal with it this way and actually keep it moving. So that's, uh, that. I think for me, that's probably the funniest, a bit of humorous moment there in the Springbok jersey, which a lot of players that I played with every knew. And probably now others who didn't know me probably know that I snore now, but I suppose my kids give me trouble most of the time when they're upset and they're like, are you making a noise? It's like, like something I can do, must stay awake for a little bit. So those are those are the things I think um, one cannot forget. I mean, there's a lot more, but I think that one was on the top of my tongue when it comes to that situation. That's a great story. Uh, tell us, Lawrence, what are you up to these days? No, I'm still, uh, obviously, this time, I think the privilege of having a bit of private time and trying to keep most of the stuff private and obviously young family, some of us had to wait until the rugby career was over to restart and obviously build their personal families and stuff like that because it was pretty difficult to juggle family and playing at the same time because you really need to put your, your basket in one area. Uh, this time I'm still involved with rugby, but behind the scene and mostly in consulting. I mean, I do from coaching, specialized coaching, commentating, analyzing. And family-wise, it, give it gives me more time with the family as well. We've got a few things that obviously with the family we're trying to do and keep it moving and stuff like that. Just get, be able to live as well because you don't want your passion to be frustrating in such an extent that actually you, you, you're you not happy. So I'm happy at this point in time. Obviously, one is always going to be happy for better things coming forward. But like I said, we have to wait for that opportunity in that area to make sure that you really excel. But uh, I mean, like I said, uh, I enjoy those things. I do a bit of those things. And obviously with the rugby currently, I am busy uh, with the analyzing stuff, obviously for the national broadcaster here at SCBC, uh, which I actually got opportunity as well to broadcast most of the games in the World Cup, which we quite enjoyed because we brings us back into an element of what we love outlive ourselves, you actually, you know, that's when you ooze confidence when you're around this space and making sure that you do what you love. And obviously you don't want passion to passion and frustration to actually merge. So you find a way to actually make it work. And this currently, this is what I'm actually doing at the moment. Sounds good to me. Lawrence, we're going to finish off by looking at that trivia question again. In 2003, 
The Springboks started their international season with a two-test series. Who were the opponents? Do you know the answer, Lawrence? 2003. I'm trying to think. It must have been the European, European countries that came to South Africa. Uh, because it probably before the championship, Scotland. That is exactly right, Lawrence. It was Scotland. Yes, it was. Uh, we beat them 2-0, thankfully. And uh, after that, we played Argentina. Uh, you might remember Louis Kuhn kicked a penalty right at the end for us to win. I think it was 26-25, actually. Uh, and then the Tri-Nations began. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, so the, the concussion machine is still working quite fine. Uh, it's not broken yet. <laughs> 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 Lawrence, let me say it was lovely having you on Front Row Rugby today. A real joy to listen to those old stories and reliving uh, those happy moments uh, and even some of them not so happy moments. But great of you to come and talk to us about all of those things. And I really hope we can have you on again in the future. No, thank you, Peter, man. It's always good, man, that someone really tries to keep uh, the Springbok brand alive wherever they are at this point in time. Hopefully, you get more viewership and always keep on growing and get some more superstars to come on your show, probably while they're still playing as well, because I'm sure you want a, a bit of that inside info as well at some point. But I know it's very tricky, that one, sometimes because the players try to toe the line and actually making sure that they stay strong. But thank you for inviting me. I really enjoyed it as well. Last time on Front Row Rugby, 1998 Tri-Nations champion Stefan Tablanche was my guest. You can go and watch that video. It's appearing on your screen right now. Next time, Tox van der Linde will be here.